welcome in today's lecture. Today, we shall be talking about a very important subject which is a concern of the world bodies and organizations as well as of a common man. And this concerns the depletion of ozone layer. Ozone layer in stratosphere is a natural feature of Earth's environment containing a relatively high concentration of ozone. O3 layer is mainly found in the lower portion of the stratosphere from approximately 20 to 30 kilometers above Earth's surface, although the thickness varies seasonally and geographically. The phytochemical mechanisms that give rise to the ozone layer were discovered by the British physicist Sidney Chapman in 1930 and reported that ozone molecule in the Earth's stratosphere is created when the ultraviolet light strikes oxygen molecule and disassociates it in react to oxygen atoms. The ozone formed distributes itself in the stratosphere forming a layer that is thin in some places, thick in others. The thickness of the ozone layer, that is the total amount of ozone in a column overhead varies by a large factor worldwide, being in general smaller near the equator and larger towards the poles. It also varies with seasons, being in general thicker during the spring and thinner during the autumn in the northern hemisphere. The reason for this latitude and seasonal dependence are complicated, involving atmospheric circulation patterns as well as solar intensity. The ozone molecule is also unstable, but when ultraviolet light hits ozone, it splits into an oxygen molecule and an oxygen atom. It is a continuing process called ozone-oxygen cycle, thus creating an ozone layer in the stratosphere. About 90% of the ozone in our atmosphere is contained in the stratosphere. As already said, ozone concentrations are greatest between 20 and 40 km, where they range from about 2 to 8 parts per million. If all the ozone were compressed to the pressure of the air at sea level, it would be only 3 mm thick. It is in the way that the stratospheric ozone shields us from ultraviolet radiations. Dear friends, it doesn't really reflect the heat like a mirror, but rather absorbs it and transforms it into heat which is released back into space. Brewer Dobson circulation. Ozone layer is higher in altitude in the tropics and lower in altitude in the extra tropics, particularly in the polar regions. This altitude variation of ozone results from the slow circulation that lifts the ozone pore air out of the troposphere into the stratosphere. As this air slowly rises in the tropics, ozone is produced by the overhead sun, which photolyzes oxygen molecule. As this slow circulation bends towards the mid-latitudes, it carries the ozone-rich air from the tropical middle stratosphere to the mid and high latitudes of lower stratosphere. The high ozone concentrations at high latitudes are due to the accumulation of ozone at lower altitudes. The time needed to lift an air parcel from the tropical tropopause near 16 to 20 km is about 4 to 5 months. Even though ozone in the lower tropical stratosphere is produced at a very slow rate, the lifting circulation is also slow that ozone can build up to relatively high levels by the time it reaches 26 kilometers. This puzzle is explained by the prevailing stratospheric wind patterns known as the brewer dobson circulation. The total column amount of ozone generally increases as we move from the tropics 
to the higher latitudes in both hemispheres. However, the overall column amounts are greater in the northern hemisphere, high latitudes than in the southern hemisphere, high latitudes. In addition, while the highest amounts of column ozone over the Arctic occur in the northern spring, that is from March to April, the opposite is true over the Antarctic, where the lowest amounts of column ozone occur in the southern spring, that is from September to October. Now, let us talk about ozone depletion. In the stratosphere, ozone is continuously created and destroyed by the sun radiation. This results in the equilibrium in the concentrations of ozone. The equilibrium is, however, disturbed when react to chlorine atoms released from photolysis of chlorofluorocarbons. These atoms create an imbalance by destroying ozone molecules. The loss of ozone molecule in the upper atmosphere is referred as ozone depletion. The ozone layer can be depleted by free radical catalysts including nitric oxide, nitrous oxide, hydroxyl radical, chlorine atoms and bromine atom. The concentration of chlorine and bromine have increased markedly in recent years due to the increase of large quantities of man-made organohalogen compounds, particularly chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs and bromofluorocarbons. These highly stable compounds are transported to the stratosphere after being emitted at the surface. The reactive chlorine atoms generated from the chlorofluorocarbon molecules are stable in lower atmosphere. However, when they reach the stratosphere, the solar radiation splits them into chlorine atoms. They are capable of surviving the rise to the stratosphere where chlorine and bromine radicals are liberated by the action of ultraviolet radiations and each radical is able to initiate and catalyze a chain reaction breaking down over 100,000 ozone molecules. Ozone levels over the northern hemisphere have been dropping by 4% per decade. In 2009, nitrous oxide was the largest ozone depleting substance emitted through the human activities. But due to the increase in anthropogenic activities and release of ozone depleting substances in atmosphere, the rate of destruction of ozone molecules exceeds the rate of formation. Now let us try to understand mechanism of ozone depletion and before that, firstly we will have to understand what is ozone depletion potential. The concept of ozone depletion potential or ODP came from Webbles in 1983. It is defined as the relative amount of degradation to the ozone layer it can cause with chlorofluorocarbon 11 being fixed at a highest ODP of 1.0 among the chlorofluorocarbon compounds. Precisely, ODP of a given substance is defined as the ratio of global loss of ozone due to given substance over the global loss of ozone due to chlorofluorocarbon 11 of the same mass. Now there are some substances which are called as ozone depleting substances. Chlorofluorocarbons which we shortly pronounce as CFCs. Chlorine, fluorine and carbon atoms are the main constituents of this group of compounds because of their maximum shelf life, non-toxic, non-corrosive and non-flammable nature. They have been used in refrigerators, air conditioners, spray cans, solvents, foams, etc. Halons are another group of compounds containing bromine, chlorine and fluorine, hydrogen and carbon atoms. Bromine is considered as many times more effective in destroying ozone and its ozone depletion potential range up to 10. 
They are being used in fire extinguishers, methyl bromide, an effective pesticide with ozone depletion potential of 0.4 is also among the contributors for the ozone depletion. But here we still discuss the ozone depletion by only chlorine and nitric oxide radicals. Chlorine radicals? Roland and Molina in 1974 speculated that ultraviolet radiations could, could break a chlorine atom from a chlorofluorocarbon molecule. So the chlorine is a free radical, like a free agent in baseball, that reacts with ozone molecule and then creates chlorine oxide, which is unstable. It usually attracts single oxygen atom, thereby producing an oxygen molecule and once again freeing the free radical. This produces a self-perpetuating cycle that can continuously break down ozone molecules. In other words, a single molecule of chlorofluorocarbon, once it reaches the stratosphere, could break down more than 100,000 molecules of ozone as the chlorine continuously frees itself. Ozone depletion by oxides of nitrogen. The concentration of nitrous oxide over the past years has shown a steady increase. This has been attributed due to large-scale combustion of fossil fuel and enhanced use of nitrogenous fertilizers. Nitrous oxide as well as other oxides of nitrogen are also emitted by supersonic transport aircrafts. Though nitrous oxide is quite inert in stratosphere, it is phytochemically converted into more reactive nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is able to destroy so much of the ozone because it is a catalyst. After each reaction, nitric oxide is able to begin the destructive cycle again with another ozone molecule. Ozone depletion occurs over Antarctic. The reactions for ozone depletion can occur all over the stratosphere. However, the ozone hole has been mainly observed in the stratosphere or Antarctica. In other parts of the stratosphere, two key reactions occur that bind chlorine monoxide and chlorine atoms. The presence of oxides of nitrogen in the stratosphere thus scavenges the chlorine monoxide radicals and the presence of methane scavenges chlorine atoms. The chlorine nitrate and hydrogen chloride form thus acts as natural reservoirs for reactive chlorine species. Once locked, the chain reaction leading to ozone depletion is not initiated. However, in Antarctica, the conditions are quite different as during winters, special types of clouds called polar stratospheric clouds or PSCs formed over Antarctica plays an important role in ozone depletion. Two types of clouds, that is type 1 clouds, which contain mostly solidified nitric oxide trihydrate, form at about minus 77 degrees Celsius, while as type 2 clouds, which contain mostly ice, form at about minus 85 degrees Celsius. On the surface of these PSCs, chlorine nitrate formed in the reaction is converted into an important reservoir of chlorine atoms into chlorine molecule and hypochlorous acid and even under mild conditions can be converted into reactive chlorine atoms paying way for ozone depletion. These reactions also convert oxides of nitrogen into nitric oxide that is incorporated in ice forming type 1 PSCs. The role of sunlight in ozone depletion is the reason why the Antarctic ozone depletion is greatest during spring. During winter, even though PSCs are mostly abundant, there is no light over the pole to drive chemical reactions. 
during the spring. However, the sun comes out providing energy to drive photochemical reactions and melt the polar stratospheric clouds, releasing considerable chlorine oxide, which drives the whole mechanism. Further, warming temperatures near the end of spring break up the vortex around mid-December. As warm ozone and nitrogen dioxide rich air flows in from lower latitudes, the PSCs are destroyed, the enhanced ozone depletion process shuts down and the ozone hole closes. Most of the ozone that is destroyed is in the lower stratosphere. In contrast to the much smaller ozone depletion through homogeneous gas phases reaction, which occurs primarily in the upper stratosphere. So far, we have learned how ozone layer is formed and the mechanism for its depletion and we come to understand that CFC molecules can destroy about 1 lakh ozone molecules before being destroyed itself. Now, let's have a look on the causes of ozone depletion. As CFCs are major culprits for ozone depletion, we must identify the sources of these compounds. Besides their low cost of manufacture, three properties were responsible for their wide industrial applications. Non-flammability, non-toxicity, and non-reactivity. Since the CFCs are non-flammable and non-toxic, they are used as coolants for refrigerators and air conditioners, for making polystyrene containers common in food packing, as blowing agents for foam plastics, as solvents for removing grease from electronic equipments and for cleaning computer chips, for firefighting as halons are used as fire extinguishers, as propellants for aerosol sprays. The reductions in ozone levels will lead to higher levels of UVB radiations reaching the Earth's surface. The sun's output of UVB radiations does not change, rather less ozone means less protection and hence more UVB radiations reach the Earth. In Antarctica, studies have shown that the amount of UVB radiations measured at the surface can double during the annual ozone hole. The United Nations Environmental Program assessment estimates that for every 1% decrease in ozone, biologically damaging ultraviolet radiation will increase 1.3%. Now, let's have a look on impact of ozone depletion on humans, which is a matter of great concern. UVB radiations are sufficiently energetic to break apart important biological molecules, including proteins and DNA, that results in increase in skin cancers, cataracts, and suppression of the human immune response system. UVB radiations cause non-melanoma skin cancers and plays a major role in malignant melanoma development also. A major effort over the last several decades has been to understand the result of human epidemiological studies that have investigated the relationship between various forms of skin cancer and increased UBV radiations. Non-melanoma skin cancers mainly include basal cell carcinomas and squamous cell carcinoma. Also, 1% decrease in stratospheric ozone is estimated to cause an increase of approximately 2.3% in non-melanoma skin cancers. Now, we shall be talking about cataracts. The potential human health effects on the eye include increased incidence of snow blindness and cataracts causes an acute inflammation of the superficial layer of the eyes. However, eye protection is available and a single incident is 
usually sufficient to encourage use of protective sunglasses. An approximate 0.5% increase in cataracts would occur for each 1% drop in stratospheric ozone. An estimated 17 million people in the world are blind due to cataracts. A 1% drop in stratospheric ozone thereof could cause an additional 3,400 cases of blindness due to cataracts each year. Impact of ozone depletion on biosphere. Marine ecosystem. The effects of aquatic ecosystems in particular on phytoplankton and larva of higher organisms are of meticulous concern. These organisms are the important link in marine food chain and support all other life forms of the sea. Current ultraviolet B radiation levels are also limiting factors for early development stages of fish, shrimp, crab, amphibians and other animals. One study estimated that a 16% reduction in stratospheric ozone levels would produce a 5% loss of phytoplankton productivity leading to a loss of approximately 7 million tons of fish from the annual fisheries harvest. Crop yield. Terrestrial plants vary considerably in their response to ultraviolet B radiations between species and even between cultivars of the same species. Plants have several mechanisms to repair adverse effects from ultraviolet B radiations and may acclimate to a certain extent to increased UVB radiation levels. In agriculture, reduction in stratospheric ozone will require the use of UVB tolerant cultivars and the development of new ones. The risks of increased UVB due to stratospheric ozone depletion includes damage to crops and aquatic organisms, increased formation of ground level smog and accelerated weathering of outdoor plastics. Global warming. Another concern relates to the global warming potential associated with decrease in stratospheric ozone. With increase in global warming, ice melts which will increase ocean volume and also ocean front property will be eroded. Regulations in protecting ozone layer. In 1978, the United States, Canada and Norway enacted bans on CFCs containing aerosol sprays that are thought to damage the ozone layer. But the European community rejected an analogous proposal to do the same as in the US, CFCs continued to be used in other applications such as refrigeration and industrial cleaning until after the discovery of the Antarctic ozone hole in 1985. After negotiation of an international treaty that is called the Montreal Protocol, CFC production was sharply limited beginning in 1987 and phased out completely in 1996. Since that time, the treaty has been amended to ban CFC production after 1995 in the developed countries and later in developing countries. Today, over 160 countries have signed the treaty. This production phase out is possible because of efforts to ensure that there will be substitute chemicals and technologies for all CFC uses. On August 2nd, 2003, scientists announced that the depletion of the ozone layer may be slowing down due to the international ban on CFCs. Three satellites and three ground stations confirmed that the upper atmosphere ozone depletion rate has slowed down significantly during the past ticket. The study was organized by the American Geophysical Union. However, they reported that some breakdown can be expected to continue due to CFCs used by nations which have not banned them and due to gases which are already in the stratosphere. As already discussed, CFCs have 
very long atmospheric lifetimes ranging from 50 to 100 years. It has been estimated that the ozone layer may not recover until 2075. Compounds containing chlorine and hydrogen bonds such as HCFCs have been designed to replace the functions of CFCs. These replacement compounds are more reactive and less likely to survive long enough in the atmosphere to reach the stratosphere where they could affect the ozone layer. While being less damaging than CFCs, HCFCs can have a negative impact on the ozone layer, so they are also being phased out to protect ozone layer. As we know now that Montreal Protocol will go a long way to reduce ozone depletion and repair the ozone hole. However, if there is to be real success in the future, everyone must play their part. There are a number of things that can be done to protect the ozone layer and safeguard our health against the effects of increasing ultraviolet rays. First, to protect our own health, that can be achieved by either using sunglasses. Sunglasses that provide 99 to 100% protection against the ultraviolet radiations will reduce the chance of eye damage. Clothing. Clothes provide excellent protection against sunburn. A hat, a wide brimmed hat will also offer good protection to the eyes, ears, face and the back of your neck, areas particularly prone to sunburn. Limit exposure. The sun's rays are strongest between 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., so we have to limit exposure during these hours. Solutions for stratospheric ozone. Stop producing CFCs. Properly recycle old CFCs. Use safe alternatives. And last one, and also very important is to educate other governments for environmental policies. With this, today's lecture comes to its conclusion. Hope you have understood everything about ozone, its importance, its depletion, and moreover, the protection that will protect us from the harmful effects of ozone depletion. With this, we come to the conclusion. See you in the next lecture with some other topic. Till then, goodbye and good luck.